Good morning. Welcome to another episode of Hard Lens Media. Yes, it's kind of gloomy outside. There's rain out there. But hey, you're joining us today, and that's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing it's not raining in here. Oh, yeah. Good yeah. thing. Yeah, good thing we got a roof over our head. So uh, we got a really great episode for you guys. We have a special guest in the second hour, none other than Jimmy Dore of the Jimmy Dore Show, the show Aggressive Progressive, and also a commentator on the main show, The Young Turks. And a uh, comedian whose uh, stand-up show will be... Tomorrow in the City, where I think most of us in here are going to go see that. Our favorite nightclub jagoff comedian. <laughs> <laughs> so other than that, let's get this uh, first hour started. Um, we're going to recap um, uh, an event that we covered, uh, Socialism 2018. Uh, we were there on the first day, on July 5th, and on the last day, July 8th, at the McCormick Place. And for the most part, it, this was like a really crowded event. And we tried to get some of the main organizers, but because of the size of the people there and the, the, the amount of people there. Yeah. Well, the was, amount of people rather than the size of people. Yeah, right. Oops. Oh. oh. Well, anyway, it was <laughs> a real anyway, anyways, <laughs> anyways uh, the, the main point is this was uh, a really huge event, and so we, couldn't, we didn't have a chance to really speak to any of the main organizers because they were doing the final touches of, of the event. And uh, for the most part, I'll say this. Uh, you never know who you run into. We actually interviewed a... Uh, a famous Olympian, uh, uh, Dr. John Carlos, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that was really fun because we had no idea who he was, and we yeah. ran into him. He actually um, he was sitting down, and he bumped his head on this railing. So Kit talked to him. We started talking with him. Yeah. And they're like, hey, you interested in the interview? He's like, sure. And I remember when uh, – because we had no idea he was an Olympian. He's actually very famous. He was in the uh, 1968 Olympics. And he's uh, – if you see pictures, a lot of school textbooks have it where – um, he is uh, holding his uh, fist up in the Black Power salute of oh, someone was, else. That was him. That was him. Oh, yeah. wow. He was the guy that came in third place. Yeah. No, 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 no. He, him and his partner came in first and second place. The, the guy who was uh, the, the Caucasian gentleman, the Australian uh, gentleman. He, I thought he was second. No, he came in third. E- either way, it's a very, okay. he's a very famous person that made a moment in history. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we didn't know who he was. I, I think from his point of view, if you're famous, I'm sure that's kind of nice that people like you. They don't know who we are. We had no idea who he is, and I remember when I was editing, and um, we always ask people, hey, what's your name? Can you spell it? What's your position? And he said, you know, kids like, are you affiliated with any uh, in- uh, institution? She's like, he kind of saw this small smirk appear on his face. Yeah, and he's, he's like, said, hey, you don't know who I am, do you? Yeah, he said, look, 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 look me up. And yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. And then later on that night, uh, I see one of my friends, one of my mutual friends on Facebook, he um, – he he had the same photo with that gentleman, and I was like, "Oh my God, this is a famous Olympian!" And I called up Daniel, like, "Daniel, you won't believe who we interviewed at Social in 2018." <laughs> and uh, Daniel looks at it and he's like, "Oh, this guy's legit." <laughs> so it's the second uh, Olympian we've interviewed. It's been a fun run. It's yeah, who you it, run into at Socials in 2018. Yeah, yeah, and and in regards for a final note for Socials in 2018, the people we did speak to were just like average people, members of ISO or Socials Alternative or, or any other kind of uh, progressive group. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah, the the yeah. first day was like big people who yeah. had pages in it, and then the second day was – the second day we were there at least was just regular people. Yeah. And I really like that because, again, it's what we like covering is all the different perspectives of people that cover. So you get the regular people, then you get – the people who have uh, uh, made accomplishments in life already. And, uh, you know, it's one thing I would like. Maybe next year it would be nice if the organization was a little – if they let people know that we're a friendly media organization because we were getting a lot of really nasty looks. It kind of reminded me a little bit of being at a uh, a Trump event, not in the hatred. No, 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 it wasn't that. It was just like paranoia. Yeah. That's a little bit of a carryover of like – the event from last year, they were even a little more cagey. We had a couple yeah. of repeat interviews, even. Yeah, from we last did. Year. It's like, yeah. and it's like, it's, what I like is that once we get we sit down to people, the people that are willing to talk to us, we have amazing conversations and we learn a lot about why they're there and what this means. And that's really what it's all about. And you know what else? Uh, one, one final word I want to put on social in 2018 because we got to move on to another story. Uh, it's, it's that um, the idea of democratic socialism, socialism, um, it's 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 not going away. People are talking about it. People want to add it to the American political discourse, and I only can imagine that socialism twenty nineteen will be. I'm looking if, forward if, to it. If, I mean, it's it's, it's, it's probably is going to be large or larger. And I than, think that the previous if year. the trend continues, it'll be even friendlier. So I'd yeah. like to get to a point where people are happy to see us. Yeah, exactly. Our lens media is we're always, happy to be there. there. So uh, that being said, we're going to move on to um, a local story, and a lot has evolved from this. And again, this kind of shows that uh, you know it isn't. It it goes to show you that there is still a toxic environment of racism and hatred in this world. 
most notably with what happened, uh, I guess, in, at this local park here in the city of Chicago or somewhere in Illinois. Daniel, would you mind uh, explaining it? So at the Cook County Forest Preserve, there's a video that's gone viral all over Facebook, and it's made the news that um, this woman was setting up a birthday party. I think it was her own birthday party. And and she paid for the patio she, area and everything. Too. Yeah, and she was setting up, and this drunk 62-year-old just came over to her and started – very, very, uh, very, very angry. He has actually now been charged with two different hate crimes as well as disorderly conduct. I mean, it was. If you see the video, um, it's terrible because he's basically. It's also because it's also ignorance. The biggest part is it's stupid and ignorant. But I guess they compound each other. Where she's wearing a Puerto Rican shirt, and he's trying to tell her she tell her that she is an illegal immigrant, and how dare she wear a Puerto Rican shirt in America? Is she even a citizen? When most of us know that Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory, and all Puerto Ricans are automatically U.S. citizens. So he basically was ignorant enough to make fun of a U.S. citizen for being a U.S. citizen because of hate that he felt, and uh, it's just a messed up story. And then, oh. the, but the catch, the big point of this story is that happens. We see that all the time. We see this kind of hatred all the time. What's more important is the entire time this is happening, he's physically getting close to her. He's threatening her physically. Background of the video: There's just a cop standing, looking, doesn't not doing care, anything. not doing a damn thing, doesn't care, just looking at it. She keeps asking, him, "Hey, can you help me? This guy's antagonizing me. This guy's threatening me. This guy." And she, she even mentioned, "Like, look, I paid for this area. He's not even part of the party." And the and cops just like, "I don't care." But then, as soon as I think it's either her brother it's or her boyfriend, brother, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank and so, you, yeah, thank as soon you. as her brother, brother tries said, to defend her, the cop tells the brother to calm down. Yeah. And, so how you know it's fine that this sixty-two-year-old white guy is who's being, drunk, who's drunk, is being racist and aggressive. That's fine. Yeah. But how dare you start trying to defend yourself against that? Since that's happened, I think it was such a – I mean it looks horrible. You see literally a police officer watching a woman get accosted by racism yeah. and being threatened and just looking going, eh, it's not my issue. And, or it's not my problem. And the thing is yeah. like he was defending the um, this, this drunk old white yeah. guy more than he was defending the woman who obviously was very frightened. If I was her, I'd be scared too. Yeah. And look, it just, this goes to show you that it's – racism is now being filmed. It's It's – the people who are just so brutal and so hateful, like now we know who they are. And, and because of President Trump, I think also of his boldness and all the things he says and all the horrible things that he said, uh, all these people think they now have permission to do so and act like this. And the thing is, it's only going to no. last so long until, I mean, they've literally, without trying to, we now have a list of all the people that are racist in the country, which we could have never made without Trump. So that's yeah. one thing going forward. But what's interesting, there's two parts to this. First is the outcome. Uh, second is the outcome. But first is it's important to realize that police are actually, by law, under Supreme Court uh, decision, under no obligation to protect you if they choose not to. There is when they see on every single squad car across the nation, protect and serve. That's not true. Cops do not have an obligation to protect you if they see you drowning. They have no obligation to save you. If this situation happens, they have no legal obligation to stop it. Yeah. They can pick and choose, and they picked and choose to protect the drunk guy. So what turned out was, because this was some that don't know how it would happen if it wasn't filmed, yeah. the um, officer has since resigned. Yeah, originally he was on desk duty. He originally, of course, desk duty with pay, and I'm mm-hmm. sure if he's resigned, he's still going to get a nice pension, as always, or go to another police station. And this individual really got the book thrown at him, and I think it's the... Police going, oh, man, if we don't throw the book at this guy, everyone's going to think our police force is racist, which, you know, as we see from that cop, some of them are, and they don't want to protect people. So, well, so I've mentioned this before when talking about videos like this that get released. This is not a new thing. Nope. This has been happening in this country for centuries. Um, But now we live in an era where everyone has cell phones and can record things on the regular. And this is so in vogue, particularly in this particular political climate we have where immigration issues are being brought to bear, where uh, our executive branch is constantly spouting racist rhetoric or dog whistling at the very least. This is the kind of thing that gets a lot of traction. And I say, keep doing it. Like, keep filming these incidents because the more examples we have out there, the more we can say, this is these are the areas that need to be reformed. Our police need to need to be administering uh, justice and safety measures equally to all people, and not protecting racists and not and 
and allowing them to harass people for no good reason. Yeah, and and you know, so again, this guy uh, who was ass- who was verbally assaulting this woman was charged with a hate crime. The cop has since resigned, and on top of that, too, there's even been talk about a Puerto Rican uh, party happening in front of the ga- in front of the person who made this assault. Uh, towards her at at his house. It's gonna be a huge party apparently. Also, the this was big. The governor of Puerto Rico also said that that guy should be fired. Now, I literally, when I read that, I was like, oh, something might happen. Someone in power said something about this. Maybe something will happen now. And, and, and don't it, know if that was and, and all it did, that but, did. But but you know, at the end of the day, too, look, look, Puerto Rico and the people who live in Puerto Rico are U.S. citizens. All right, they're you know right now that island is still recovering, still recovering from the devastating hurricanes. And you, you know, and you know, on top of that too, um, this incident—it's it, nothing new. It's actually—it's been going on for such a long time. Thankfully, now we have smartphones and camcorders to, to record this kind of stuff. Because I guarantee you, this something like this uh, that happened to this poor woman is happening all across this country. And also remember that every time you see one of these, when you see an instance like this on film, it's always a tip of the iceberg scenario because. Other cases that may be filmed may, may not be filmed as well, or it may not be filmed, but it happens the same way or worse. Mm-hmm. So for every instance like this where justice is served, there are probably hundreds or thousands where this happens and this someone else has to just deal with it. Yeah. You know, it's funny that this video doesn't really fall into this category, but I've seen a huge uptick in basically racist individuals trying to find corner case regulations to say that someone that they don't like is doing something like the the woman who called on the people who were trying to barbecue in the park or the you don't have a permit to do this or you you're not allowed into this swimming pool even though you actually live here i'm going to block you from getting into this residence because i don't recognize you even though you live in this community yeah like all of these like i'm going to try and find some corner case regulations by technicality right yeah yeah like that's been the that's been the current wave that I've been seeing a lot of. Yeah, but the thing is, like, as soon as they are trying to enforce these "quote unquote" regulations, they're 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 trying to make themselves seem like they're they're responsible citizens, when in fact they're they're being clearly racist. It's, and it's white knighting. It, yeah. It's white knighting as a racist. Yeah, and and so and, and also on top of that too. Look, I really doubt the police or anyone else really cares about a kid selling lemonade in front of their house. It's a waste of time. You're going to call a cop. All right, it's, it's so I've, stupid. I remember when I was younger. Cops are called on me for selling lemonade. It's, oh, gee, it's a terrible because it's like, great, this is, yeah. It's just, guys, can we be a little just more considerate? And when we see something stupid that isn't an issue that everyone does, yeah. to not selectively enforce it because we don't like the person. It just makes it makes America what it is now. It's yeah. this, this yeah. hatred born of ignorance and fear with the, with the addition of time. Yeah, and one other thing, too. Look. In that video, that guy is saying like the world's not going. America, the world will not change. America, America is not going to change. Well, guess what? The world is always going to change. Yeah. Nothing's going to remain the same. Saying and, it doesn't yeah. mean anything. Yeah. People Hum- saying things means something. The only thing that's constant in the world is that nothing is constant. Exactly. That being said, we're going to uh, see something that is constant, uh, especially with the Democratic Party, and that is this huge feud that's happening right now between Alexandria Ocasio Cortez who is the winner of the Democratic congressional primary in the New York 14th District and against uh, the former incumbent uh, Crowley. So as we all know, um, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez won. She, she won bigly. There, how's that sound, guys? Bigly. She, nice. she won oh, bigly. Good irony. But, but it, it's, again, this shows you just how uh, inept and stupid the Democratic Party is, especially this guy Crowley, who did this whole uh, song and dance to uh, basically say that I'm going to support uh, – Okasa, and I'm going to uh, help her out and everything else. But no, he's still on the ballot, and he's running as a third-party candidate. L- literally a song. Yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah, he sang a Bruce Springsteen uh, song. And it was very clear yeah. that he was going to. That was his own victory song. He's like, ah, oh, I didn't expect this to happen. Yeah, and and so now it, it, again, this this kind of goes back to an old sta- uh, statement said by Jimmy Dore that the Democrats would rather uh, lose to a Republican than have a progressive or Democratic socialist win. And it's quite clear that. Alexandria has a huge uh, following. She has a huge infrastructure support. She's got support of DSA as well as uh, numerous other progressive groups. But, again, clearly Crowley is still on the ballot. So let's go in a little bit more in-depth about what's happening here. So 
he's he's still on the ballot and he had an opportunity to actually get off of the ballot but he, instead um his campaign is still going through with it and in in that note so let's let's go with what that means why that is the case so the way new york law works with parties if someone wins a nomination but they want to leave like uh, alexandria had the same thing she won a working families party um, vote in another district and she she turned it down which means that that party can now nominate someone else if they choose to for mm-hmm. that seat but you need someone to either move out move out of the area die uh, i think there's one other thing or just say i decline the nomination mm-hmm. so what crowley's done is he's had this whole song and dance of oh i'm going to make sure everyone i, I lost i'm going to be gracious i'm going to help uh, alexandria win and so that's not the case because the even the working party the people which was a huge issue that they nominated him in the first place and snubbed Alexander, which is the reason that they're in that spot in the first place. Mm-hmm. So I don't know why they thought that getting Crowley in would, would help them at all. So now they want to actually put someone else in, and they're like, Crowley, get out. We don't want you. Alexander's like, hey, get out. We don't want you. And Crowley was like, I promise I will get out. But like Kit said, he's refusing to say, take me off the ballot. And also on top of that, we got, we got to remember just – what kind of win this was. And I'm going to hand it over to Paul real quick. Okay. Remember, Crowley was the heir apparent to Nancy Pelosi. All right. Alexandria Ocasio's win was so big that it basically disrupted the Democratic establishment's chain of command and power. All right. So now that he's gone, that ruins Nancy Pelosi's plans as well as the Democratic establishment plans. And by him remaining on the ballot, you know, he could just say, like, look, I, just help me out, Nancy Pelosi and Democratic establishment, and I can win. So he so again like the Democrats are going to back this loser who is acting like a child. Isn't it interesting how the Democrats in every election when this happened demand unity? Hey, get behind the winner. When we win, you stand behind us. But when it's the other way around, well, I'm going to stay silent. I'm not going to say anything. It's because you know that if Alexandria had lost and she did what Crowley's doing, every Democrat in across the country on every single cable TV show will be screaming at her for being a sore loser, but again, but the it's some murmurs. The, the neoliberal establishment will not say a thing. They're going to remain silent. They're going to be cowards. And again, this Democrat, the Democratic establishment, this is why you lose elections. This is why no one respects you. This is why when it comes down to key seats of power, you're losing to Democratic Socialists of America and you're losing— And Republicans. And, and Republicans. So the thing is, you, know, you, you, you demand unity. You demand respect. You demand people to fall in line. But how can we respect you guys when you keep on losing? And not to mention, this isn't the first time the Democratic establishment uh, refuses to step in or call for unity or even or either that remain neutral. Uh, look at the governor's race in New York and how they're backing up Cuomo. And instead, they're throwing Cynthia, Cynthia Nixon uh, on, on the train tracks, man. Yeah, like, like, like they're disrespecting her. Mm-hmm. Tom Perez, DNC. Yeah. I will promise to be neutral in all elections and, and except what, for this one. And what does he do? He, the, the Democratic establishment endorses uh, Cuomo for governor. So, again, like, I know, Paul, you want to mention a uh, follow-up with this story. Yeah, there's, there's a whole lot to go with this story, and part of it to tack on what you guys are saying. Think about the number of times Democrats are willing to fight hard and fight dirty against Republicans. Oh, well, yeah. wait, that doesn't happen. No, they never they, do. They roll over at the first opportunity. Oh, we can't do this. But as soon as a progressive comes in and challenges their seat, they are willing to fight dirty. The we- Working Families Party doesn't want Crowley to be on the ballot. But because there's some legal hurdles to jump through to rescind their endorsement from early on, he's just going to latch on to that and be like, well, I'm on the ballot. And while he, you know, vigorously, you know, he said he would vigorously support Ocasio-Cortez's candidacy, he's obviously not going to do that through being on the ballot. And this is the, that kind of like he's also showed her up <clears throat> on a number of phone calls. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and apparently also his campaign is indicating that. Uh, her campaign is uh, being childish and politically craven when, in fact, uh, it was her, her campaign that reached out to them and said, like, hey, what's what's going on yeah. here? I thought we were having unity. I thought his, his be, literal yeah. response to this is, no, I'm gaslighting you. Yeah. He's, uh-huh. and, and again, it doesn't make him look like a strong political player. It doesn't make him look like it, this just makes the Democratic know. Party look even weaker that in defeat, they just snivel and cry. It's childish. Yeah. And you look at the rest of the Democratic Party and they're. Obviously, on Crowley's side, look at what Tammy Duck, uh, Duckworth said. 
you know, when asked, I forget what show she was on, but she was asked if this is the new direction of the Democratic Party, and, and she basically echoed that now standard Democratic Party line of like, oh, Ocasio-Cortez won in this it was a special, super special, special district. Like, yeah. <laughs> They'll never win the Midwest. And it's like, I'm sorry, I'm pretty sure Bernie Sanders won Michigan and a lot of Midwest states like Kansas. Won, and then won, when Clinton won, was he, on the ballot, Trump won. He won Wisconsin. Uh, Bernie Sanders won Wisconsin. Michigan, all the states Indiana. Hillary lost. Yeah, right. I think you have one. Uh, I think you also won Minnesota too. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what's important is that we shouldn't change strategy. We should do the exact same thing we did before, despite the fast the fact that we lost the House, the Senate, and the executive the, branch. The truth yeah. is, people, why are they doing this? It's, you have to understand, in a rules for ruler sense, everything that's happened is very obvious why it's happening. Right. It's that they're not in power to govern. They're, in a sense, like business people. Yeah. This is how they make money. The if same you're Nancy people Pelosi, who donate to, to the Republican Party or the yeah. same people who donate to the Democratic Party. But it's Party. like Nancy Pelosi. She says she's a master legislator. That's just a talking point. What she's really good at is raising money and yep. making herself rich and mm-hmm. having personal power. Mm-hmm. For the Democratic Party, it's just like they're public. not good at public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> it's about getting and maintaining your own power and building it in a hierarchy. Screw the people you mm-hmm. represent. It's about me and my power and me building up that power and that money and that wealth. That's why uh, congressmen are millionaires. And people are – it's so funny when people attack Sanders like, oh, he has a second house when he is a – it's it's almost impossible to be poor when you're a senator. He's literally the least wealthy senator yeah. and pe- of all and of the, the senators And the Democrats are like, oh, he has a house and he has a – a sixty thousand dollars like, and a seven hundred dollar jacket. But 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 here's, <laughs> but, here's, but here's the thing. How here's the thing. dare he? The How Democratic establishment he? doesn't inspire loyalty or confidence or trust. It only and, does on the inside. I, only it does in the inside. But here's 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 another issue too that maybe we haven't even looked at is that maybe Crowley's also being told not to get off the ballot by Nancy Pelosi because this must have really affected her uh, bottom line. Yeah, because you know? this causes an entire leadership shakeup where. He was pretty much he had he was it was funny from his point of view he had been enemies with her for like eight years and he finally gets her to like him and he's like I'm finally gonna be the next speaker and mm-hmm. then he gets knocked out so he's at the pinnacle of career and he and he falls and now internally in the Democratic Party there is a big shakeup yeah. and there are certain people that are much more left leaning they're not maybe progressives as we would see like with Sanders or Alexandria. Yeah. But they're much more left leaning than Nancy Pelosi or Crowley is yeah. that now have a chance of being that person. Mm-hmm. So, so Alexandria Ocasio Cortez made an excellent point along these lines. We're talking about sort of progressive candidates versus your establishment candidates. Joanne Reed, six months ago or so, had said, listen, all candidates take corporate money. And now we just had Alexandria Ocasio Cortez win her primary without taking any corporate money. And she points out, very rightly so, there are 60 candidates, either in their primaries or have already won their primaries, that do not take corporate money. If you get a chance to see that interview, it's really funny because Jory, her face is just like her face is amazing. Just deer in a headlight. Like, oh man, is that true? And so uh, Joanne is Joanne is like one. Just to get a little bit off Alexander to Joanne, she's one of the worst shills that exist in media. She's nothing more than a propagandist, like Sean Hannity. Mm-hmm. She has been gaslighting progressives and and just making things up for the or, last two years the last two years and yeah as soon as they've been on the radar she's been trying to squash squash progressives and now what's really funny in my point of view is from that media perspective as these wins continue to build up mm-hmm. the media has made a strong enemy of progressives over the years and so as progressives continue to take power you know they're going to start kissing their asses that's going to happen more but i think it's what's funny is we have like media like ourselves, TYT, a lot of other stations who are eventually going to be the progressive and be like, why would I ever go on mainstream media oh, yeah. and share my power? Because all mainstream media is built on is how can I get in so I can get access? But why would progressives give access to people that want to stab them in the back when they can just go online? Yeah. So they're going to start realizing, oh, no, oh, no, we're going to either they're going to be worried now about their money or they're going to realize at some point that they don't have – What's MSN going to do when political pundits that aren't in power anymore or people that were from an old non-progressive, they're, they're going to be irrelevant. Or, and they, or either that they're going to twist it because uh, here's the thing. But that's the, only going to work the, for so long. The neoliberal establishment system that we have, especially corporate media, they are incapable of change and they're going to die out. That's, it's, it's a simple fact. 
No one trusts corporate media. They're, their business oh, they're model all friends. itself is falling apart. They're, they're too. all friends. Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, yeah. CBS, whatever. All right. At the end of the day, it might look like they're fighting each other, saying, "Oh, Fox News is bad. CNN is bad." They're all friends with each other. Yeah. They all talk to each other, and it's all one big show. And they're trying to, you know, convince us all that we need to go in separate camps. And the thing is, they're they're, they're failing to do their job. And same thing with the. Uh, Democrat and Republicans. Now, I'm not talking about the voters. I'm talking about the establishment yeah. parties themselves. They are all friends with each other, too. They know the same people on Wall Street. They know the same corporations. They know they all the, the same, same wealthy people. They're, they're all friends. So when you see them fighting each other, don't don't ever assume like, yeah, that's my guy we fighting should, for me. They're we, all friends. We should start awarding uh, Emmys to yeah. uh, congressmen. <laughs> who, who, yeah, who can actually really act and make it make us believe that, oh, wow, wow, this Democrat's really strong. Or this Republican really made this uh, powerful talking point. When in fact, no, don't don't believe them because they're all bought. I, right? I they, think, they, go yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Paul. I think you're still going to see progressive candidates going on these mainstream shows. You see Alexandria yeah. Ocasio-Cortez doing it now that she's got a major platform and she's using it for real good. Bernie Sanders still does it. And you're not, I don't think you're going to see a lot of, um, you know, guest appearances on smaller shows like, you know, Secular Talk, Humanist Report, our show. Um, because at this point in time, while the tides are shifting, mm -hmm. at this point in time, the viewership is still on cable news. Well, yeah. That, well, actually, in that, in that sense, it really, it's not at this point. I mean, advertiser dollars actually from last year are now more into the Internet. Yeah. Than they are on TV. The, 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 but I agree with the, the main point you're trying to make. I agree. If I, if I came off another way, that's what I mean to say is that it's a looking in the future where they are. The TV is dying as an industry. They are losing money. Like I said, they've already or ad revenue, which is what their backbone is, is already less mm -hmm. than what it is on the internet. There's a very specific point where television will just all of a sudden become not profitable, and that's going to be a combination of where people are moving to the Internet, which is already happening, most eyes. That's why you have Fox viewership is, I think their median age is uh, 72, CNN is 70, and MSN is 68, because everyone oh. younger uh, MSNBC, is online. MSNBC has a lot of young punk kids watching their shows. Yeah, that's, huh? what they, that's what they like <laughs> to say. But that's still the point. Everyone's online. so All those kids under 70. At some point, that model is just going to fall apart. Yeah, and that's the moment. And then what could have made it last longer is if they hadn't betrayed the people that uh, are being elected into office right now. So it's just all I'm saying is it's it's hastening their own demise, and they don't see it because they're too busy collecting their paycheck. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, we're going to follow through with this story. Chances are Crowley is going to remain on the ballot. He's going to be as corrupt as any other neoliberal establishment candidate. And he so, could split the vote, which could be really bad. Yeah, and o o Ocasio Cortez, um, I wish her all the best in her campaign. She is a legitimate nominee. She won fair and square against Crowley, but it seems quite clear that the Democratic establishment hasn't learned anything from 2016. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that she does win. And it's, it's quite clear that this is this is we're, we're, we're going to see stories similar to this as the primaries continue on until we get to the November uh, general election. So that being said, Daniel, uh, we got a story about our friend Elon Musk and he, wanting to help out the uh, homes in Flint, Michigan. Yeah. What's, what's going on? So with Elon? let me give a little background on this for people that haven't been following what's happened with Elon. So. Of course, there was the um, the cave where the, uh, the the soccer team was trapped. They've luckily they've gotten all those kids out. Um, he had uh, he actually he started with someone on Twitter contacted him and said, "Hey, can you do anything about this?" Because of course, Elon Musk runs one of the best um, uh, 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 brain banks of engineers in the planet, and so because there was a few kids that were perhaps too weak to move, and. Uh, Elon even put out a, a tweet uh, later on in this where he's talking back and forth with the actual people running this dive, and they're saying, yeah, make sure you put this together. We don't know if this last child was going to be strong enough. They've tested it. The engineer said, yeah, it'll fit in this cave, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But on the other side, you have the angry mob on Twitter who is chastising him for trying to do something. He's like, oh, it's just – he just wants publicity, which is – you know." Why don't you guys do something on your own rather than just critique a guy who's trying to do something? I think it's becoming like a cool thing to it, hate on Elon. It is. It's, and I really don't like it because most of it is, you know, I follow Elon. I followed him for years. It's ignorance. It's the same kind of ignorance we talked about in the previous story that they hear something. They say, okay, if I hear billionaire and it goes through my mind, I instantly filter it this way. Elon Musk is a billionaire. 
oh, billionaires never try and do anything great because they're not a human like I am, so therefore he's just trying to do publicity. It's a very shallow way of looking at the world. Now, granted, there are, why aren't they hitting other billionaires? Because they're not in the spotlight, because yeah. they just sit back on their hordes of gold and do nothing yeah. but build that hoard of gold up, whereas what? Elon Musk is like, I'll try and do this. So now going to this story, yeah. after that's happened, Elon – so his, he has a very large Twitter following. They said, okay, let's try something else. Elon, can you fix Flint? And Elon said, okay, let's see what I can do. And so he is going to be looking into uh, fixing the remaining piping that's in Flint. And it looks like they've replaced the main lines at this point, And they really need that last 100 feet yeah. to be replaced. So if Elon Musk can do what the government can't and fix Flint, I think that's – Phenomenal, yeah, and that's great. But There's he's the, gonna get attacked because of who, of how much money he has, not by what he's doing. Right. So there's something else I want to add on to this too. Look, um, you know, I've been following some of the hate that Elon Musk is, is getting uh, uh, on just just. Be, I don't know. I think it's pointless and stupid because it, we're down for Elon, especially this in is an outrage in, in investing in space technology. I mean, he already showed that NASA's current model was. Way over budget. He can get us into space a lot cheaper and more efficiently. So the way I look at like this is like Elon, Elon Musk has gone on the record to state that NASA should get more funding. And I'm pretty sure if we sit him down, he would probably say like, yeah, uh, there, the government should be funding this. There should be enough resources. When he, when for, he, for, started, for, yeah. spa- when he started SpaceX, the original goal he had – this is way back when he was starting. When people ask why are you starting this, he's like, "I just want to help NASA." Yeah, I want to. He, he originally just wanted to build a greenhouse on Mars that he sends a probe to, so that he can inspire people, so that NASA can get more funding. Yeah, but yeah. he turned out he was really good at that. Yeah, and you, look, the people of Flint, Michigan, have been dealing with this lead poisoning for what over four years, five years now. It's been too long. Yeah, it's been way too long. And so finally, you have somebody stepping up to build some kind of working infrastructure for the community. They desperately need clean drinking water. We need clean drinking water. The city of Chicago has lead in its water, okay? So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm really disappointed at our current state governments and our federal government and their lack of action in helping out the taxpaying citizens. So here you have one, one guy, Elon Musk, by himself. A uh, who's you know, actually trying to invest back in people, which is unheard of in this country. And yeah. I mean, usually it's, it's like – It's, 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 put, it's so put, unheard of. It's you, foreign. You put, usually what happens is they put together a foundation that kind of does stuff, usually doesn't. I mean you have you know, individuals like Bill Gates who have actually done a lot. They, yeah. they, I mean it's, there are people that are doing things, but it's like – don't like the billionaires that are screwing people over. Don't hate on the billionaires that are trying to do good. Yeah, and and look, and the same thing too is like Elon Musk is definitely trying to, you know, inspire new generations of uh, children and young people to get involved in the sciences and engineering. Like even here in the city of Chicago, he's got this uh, hyperloop that he's trying to build here in the city, just to say that hey, it can work. So yeah. hopefully, hopefully I, and again, like if we had a representative from the Boring Company or Elon Musk himself, if you want to reach out to us, we would definitely have a few questions to ask you about uh, the Hyperloop that you're building here in the city of Chicago. But we got so many other questions to really ask, too, especially in regards to this current status of, of our country. Uh, we are lacking true infrastructure. We're, uh, lacking, a, we're lacking a vision at yeah. all. And at least Elon has a vision to try and do what, granted, government should be doing, but they're yeah. not. And we were talking a couple of weeks ago about how, how he's funding, trying to fund a lot of public transportation, or in his case, private, because the Koch brothers are terrific at killing any public transportation bills. So the one that fossil fuel money. Europe has really good high speed rail, really good public transit that's well subsidized. But if that happened here, the Cokes would make less money because less cars would run. There'd be less oil being used. Yeah. So they can't have this. So they're killing these projects all over the country with their grassroots organizations that they fund with a tremendous amount of money. So governments are weak and inept, and the system that runs them is weak and inept compared to the single-mindedness that a person, an individual with money can have. So in a situation like that, I know that there are actually, for, for the for the tunnel at least, there are some very valid arguments, I think, that we've heard uh, against it, but I think it's in the situation that America is in with nothing happening, some progress is better, even if it's private, because everything else is just a subsidy given to companies to do very little. Right. Or, oh, rep- repave the roads, something that might take two weeks. Let's stretch it out to six months so that we get more money from it. Yeah. It's If he can pull that off, again, it goes to 
a f- what he what he hit his full vision of a hyperloop system. Again, this is again just a way to proof of concept it. Have business people say, "Oh, this is a good idea." I don't. It just he's trying to change things in a direction I think most people want the country to go, which is green and sleek and futuristic. Move us past where we're at now. We already live in the future. We just don't pay for it, so we yeah. live in the past. And yes, it's private what he's doing, but it's something. And I wish people would see that as. It's better than what we have now by a long shot, and he is—he seems to be aligned in a way to want to help people. And yeah. I, I rather, try, I'd rather take his help right now because well, but look, because like, the but, governor in Michigan failed the people of uh, of Flint, Michigan. But right? it's like you Correct. don't you don't want to get someone like that to get jaded yeah. by people. That's yeah. the last thing you want because he could. On a flip side, if this is not what he wanted to do, if he didn't want to help people, he could be very effective at it, like the Koch yeah. brothers are. But he's not. Yeah, and we right. don't want him to take his ball and go home. Yeah, no. no but definitely. at the end of the day, I mean, they've they've begun launching NASA satellites on Falcon heavies. Like that's a thing that's beginning now. Yeah, mm-hmm. our National Aeronautics and Space Administration doesn't send anything to space on its own anymore. No, and hasn't for years now. And and we even sent our astronauts to, to the Russian space program to launch them up to the International Space that's Station. That's right. And Elon, and even now, the people that were running it before were a monopoly by uh, Boeing and Northrop Grumman, who were like, hey, you want to launch something to space? That'll be $400 million just for the rocket. And Elon's like, I can do it for $80 million, thus saving the taxpayers $320 million per launch. And they all said, that can't be done. But no, he proved them all wrong. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the, and, guy, and, the guy's doing something. You can, you can argue whether or not a billionaire should be doing it. I think that's a fantastic conversation to have because it really should yeah. be the public government pooling money for projects like this. But we, we're too corrupt at least at this point in time, we're moving in a direction, I think, that we can get to a point where the government can actually do this like it should. Yeah, public correct. money should be pulled together. It should be these public works like we did in the New Deal. That should happen again. But in the meantime, he's giving us a template. Let's exactly. Yeah. It's it's not ideal, but it's better than nothing. Exactly. So, you know, again, all the best. Hopefully, like, you know, Elon Musk is able to really help out the people of Flint, Michigan. We're going to follow through with this story. Um, you know, and thankfully we got somebody stepping up to do the right thing because obviously the state government in Michigan and the federal government is just sitting on their hands, n- ignoring the people that have been suffering through this ordeal for so long. But that being said, we're going to go to another difficult story to talk about, and that's our good friends with ICE and the Democratic Party. Paul, this yeah. is uh, this is something you 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 found and wanted to share with us. What's going on with this? Yeah, so. Um Particularly since this kind of comes back to talking about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, because she really helped to bring this to the forefront. But also in light of separating families at the border, a lot of attention has been brought on to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE. Uh, and you kind of take a step back and look at that, and a lot of people um, from the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party, let's call them, are saying, you know what, we probably don't need an extrajudicial agency handling this. We have law enforcement, and we have a judicial system, and we have immigration laws that can be administered with existing tools. And we have border control. And we have border control. Uh, these were in place before ICE uh, was formed. ICE is still a relatively new agency, and it's, again, acting in an extrajudicial way. And beginning in the Trump administration, now we're, now we're separating children from their families. It's, be- it's become an agency that can be best described as the American version of the Gestapo. And now you've got a lot of people saying, we should stop this. Yeah. We should end, we should end ICE. We already have systems in place that can handle uh, immigration enforcement without having an agency that basically harasses people, gets people at courthouses, goes into places of business, abducts people. Uh, that have been living in the country for years, separating families, all of this very unsettling activity that that ICE really is doing, and and now you've got now you've got a very empathetic wing of the of the Democratic Party or, or your far lefties are saying, let's not do this, let's and, not do this and, anymore. And remember, ICE is only like what fifteen years old. It was it's, cre- it's, it's brand it, new. It's, still. It's, it's a creation that happened because of nine eleven. It yeah. goes in line with the Patriot Act. It's the same kind of legislation put out a different way it's very authoritarian and heavy-handed in its enforcement and mm-hmm. it's not really what's necessary for a humane asylum process or no. a democratic country 
Correct. Yeah, exactly. And look, we were uh, in Gary, Indiana at the Gary Chicago International Airport. Right. And look, every Friday, so that means yesterday, uh, immigrant families or immigrant individuals were deported out of the Gary Chicago International and Airport. Are, and the key is and, with this is these are almost exclusively individuals who maybe had a parking ticket yeah. that they didn't pay or they jaywalked. It's almost none of them. I think less than 10 percent have any real technical crime that we would consider, oh, they're violent or, yeah. or whatever, even if you can it, – it's almost all people that have – and, done nothing. And, and, and the fact that you have Democrats that are just basically turning a blind eye to public outrage or refusing to stand with abolishing ICE, it's quite clear that the, the, de- the main Democratic establishment party doesn't care. They don't care about the children being separate from their families. I mean, look, watching some of those videos, it's really hard to really sit through them because I, I, I don't even care what your demographic is or how you vote. When you see a kid and a, and a family get separated and there's such – primal outrage and, 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 and fear, how can you not feel empathy uh, or any kind of sympathy for, 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 these, for these people being separated? They, like, no one deserves to go through that, okay? And I'm going to take a step further. I'm not sure you can really call yourself a real American or a human yeah. if you look at that and go, yeah, this is how things have to that be. They deserve to be punished. No way. No, no. No one deserves that, okay? Like, a lot of these people coming to this country are going through a lot of hardships. And a lot of it's imposed by yeah. U.S. foreign policy. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is, like, if, if anyone's willing to walk countless I don't know how many miles, but millions of miles going through harsh terrain, dangerous territory under the threat of being killed or raped or or, or put into uh, bondage or slavery. It, 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 if somebody wants to come to this country, goes through all that, welcome. My God, do you, fact, you have endurance. You have strength. You have courage. And so, again, like I, I'm just going to bring it back to the Gary Chicago International Airport. Really you quickly, know, Chicago. Just, just want to add in. Yeah. Ice, there's a lawsuit happening right now that a judge is okayed where ICE is, has been indicted for slavery. Good. So good. Good. Uh, look, look, because because ICE is clearly making the United States and the American people look bad to the people of the free world. We always state that we are uh, a bastion of liberty and hope for people to come to. You know, the Statue of Liberty says, G- "Give me your tired, your poor, all that other stuff." I don't think she stuttered in any kind of statement <laughs> on it. Uh, she's welcoming people to come to this country and contribute. Okay, contribute. And oh, so, man, the woman that climbed the Statue of Liberty over yeah. the Fourth of July, yeah. man. Yeah. Uh, right wingers were tearing their hair out over that. She's yeah. being disrespectful to our yeah. statue. Well, the Statue of Liberty herself is an immigrant too, because she was built and made in France in and France. was given to the United States yep. as a gift. Uh, you know, and again, I just I do want to bring it back to the Gary Chicago International Airport because right. you know Rahm Emanuel, who's quote unquote doing a good job, said by Hillary Clinton during the 2016 primary, uh, even though he shut down 50 schools. Uh, he has stated that uh, you know that Chicago is a sanctuary city, so that means if you're an immigrant, you're safe here. Uh, uh-uh, uh, that's not the case. It's good because we just we just, it's it, it's so devious. He doesn't really care about sanctuary city is a political term. It's yeah. He's trying to court the Hispanic vote because he's made such an enemy of the African American vote with, with the police and everything he's done. So he's like, well, I might go to this demographic. Hey, we're a sanctuary city. We're happy with immigrants. That means nothing because what he does is he says. Immigrants aren't deported in Chicago. You're safe. We just push them to Indiana more when we do that so that we don't have to say it's done here in the city of Chicago, even though the airport that they're being sent to works directly with the city of Chicago. Chicago. Check out those interviews. It's such a a terrible technicality. You you can actually see some of the interviews that we did with some of the protesters on our YouTube channel. And on top of that, too, on the day that we were covering that protest, the buses were stopped. They didn't come to the Gary Chicago International Airport. They were just rerouted to O'Hare Airport. And last I checked, look, look, I think O'Hare is in city limits or in Cook County it limits. It is in the city limits. It is. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Rom, Rom, hey, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, why did that happen under your watch? And why, you, why Rom, why are you okay with kicking out people for jaywalking and misdemeanors when you say you're a sanctuary city? It sounds like you're just saying you're a sanctuary city. You're having your cake and eating it, too. Mm-hmm. You're kicking people out for being immigrants. You're kind of assisting us because they're like – their basic thing is – we won't help ICE unless they pay our officers. Then they're free to do it, and then we'll assist them. Yeah, and, 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 and one other thing too. A real shout out to the to uh, to the governor candidates too, like uh, Bruce Rauner and J. B. Pritzker. Uh, where's your stance on this? Uh, uh, on what's happening to these families that are being deported? They've been largely silent, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I know Governor Bruce Rauner is going to be silent, but uh, J. B. Pritzker, you know, what's your what's your comment on the Ch- Gary Chicago International Airport? I, I know you're not going to get back to us, so I'm not going to even try. But you know, just. 
just a little friendly reminder. You know, you, I wonder, you're, you're running for governor. I want to take it back to the federal level because we're in a situation where people are sort of talking past each other. I know, shocker, right? Um, but on your right wing, you've got this they took our jobs kind of mentality. Like they're coming in and they're ruining our country. That There's this dog whistle underneath it that's just basically racism. We want to keep them out of this country. And then on the Democratic Party side, you've got a little bit of a split because you've now got the Ocasio-Cortez, Bernie Sanders, the sort of progressive movement saying, we need to abol abolish ICE. These functions are taken care of by other means. This is inhumane. This is not the way it should be done. Uh, and then you've got this, your Chuck Schumers and Nancy Pelosi's who are kind of like, I can't get on board with Elizabeth Warren and Kristen Gillibrand. Only 25% of the population agree it's not a safe thing for me to do. Right. It's politically not safe. So they'll say things like, oh, well, we should reform ICE. Well, what does that mean? What do you want to do to reform ICE? There's no way you can reform an institution that corrupt, that inept, and that inhumane. You know what? That right. thing needs to go. You, you know what? After World War II, all Germany needed to do was reform the Gestapo, and they're still around. Oh, wait. No, never mind. That's, that's not, not, that's not what happened. Never mind. Never mind. Right. So here's, here's what happened is in the wake of a number of Democratic senators uh, sponsoring a bill to abolish ICE, no, thinking that Republicans wouldn't you know, even let it be talked about on the floor, Republicans kind of call their bluff because they know that for uh, centrist Democrats, they think that this is a divisive issue and they don't know what to do about it. Yeah. So they basically said, fine, we're going to we're going to call it to a vote, which is a purely political move because we know that the, I mean, they've said before that they wouldn't bring anything to a vote that they knew that President Trump wouldn't sign. And if right. this passed, President Trump wouldn't sign it. Right. right. He just wouldn't. So it's well, a political I mean, move look, look, because look, they know he, a lot he, of he has done a lot of crazy things right. in his presidency. So I mean, I wouldn't put it past it. With this president, I mean, anything goes. Hey Trump, do you want to give up your private army? No, I don't. No, but here's what's interesting: is that the sponsors of the bill mm -hmm. realize that it's a political tactic and have said that they would just vote no on their own bill. Yeah, just so that they can force uh, force some extra debate on the topic on right. the House floor. You know, I, I think I, it's again, a, again to the elected officials. Uh, Democrat and Republican, how can you look at these uh, videos and, photog and photos of these children just weeping, these families crying, these parents helpless? The, uh, you know, how can you look at that and just n not really make a, I don't know, any form of compassion? Like, what's wrong with you guys? We elect you to represent the American people. We elect you guys to do the right thing. And what's happening at the border is is so inhumane. It's it's not even America. We, we would see this in a third world country with, under a dictatorship. We would if, go to war know. with the dictatorship for it, doing it, this. But, but, but if they had oil. If they had oil. And, we, they, and, they, 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 had and oil. they didn't give us a good price already. Yeah. So what I think is really interesting is I wish that the Democratic Party would be as hard on ICE as they are on their new progressives. And see, again, this, wow, is, this, yeah. is, this, is, this is what's going to happen. So, like, either, either a couple things are going to happen. Either our revolution, Democratic Socialists of America... Justice Democrats, brand new Congress. Either they're going to be successful in taking over the Democratic Party, or in given enough time, there will be a real progressive third party. Most likely, I'm gonna I'm gonna say DSA for the moment because right now they're, they're a political well. they're a political organization. They're building infrastructure, and yes, they do run their candidates in the Democratic Party. But there is a very good possibility that they can effectively be a new party here in the United States. Something that we desperately need. Look, we need a vibrant multi-party system. It's quite clear that this two-party neoliberal establishment system that we have is failing the American people, and uh, the Democratic and Republican establishment leaders don't care about us. They don't care about you. So if you're a Democratic voter or a Republican voter, remember, the people who you elect into office are most likely millionaires and billionaires, and they probably don't like you or they don't care about you. And they only need you to vote for them because, hey, you know, who else are you going to vote for? Eh, yeah, so. it's, it's so distressing. I yeah. mean, we're in this, we're in this situation where... The Democratic Party normally, uh, historically, has found ways of expressing moral outrage. and Not to, this time. To, to some effect. And this time around, you just sort of want to go, you're, you're failing to express your moral outrage because more left-leaning Democrats are already doing that and you don't like them. So it's like you don't want to seem as though you're on that side. And now you're, now you're playing protectionist, like... Oh, I don't, if I vote on this, how are my constituents going to feel in 2020? And I think given the speed at which 
the country's attitude toward immigration and custom enforcement, ICE, has changed and shifted. Once it's become front and center, like, this is not good, this is inhumane. Yeah. Yeah, okay, right now, only 46% of Americans approve of abolishing ICE. Right. Give it another few months, I'm so, pretty sure that poll number will change. Yeah, so, like, I think that the number for right now is 25% approved, 25% are like, I'm not sure, and about 50% are... Uh, against Oppose it, it. Yeah. Oppose. but again, three months ago, that was almost entirely everyone was for ICE. Yeah, and, and now, very and now Donald, a... Donald Trump has put an ugly face on ICE. And remember, this has been yeah. going on under uh, Bush's administration and even under Obama's mm-hmm. administration. So who knows what kind of untold horror stories have yet to be revealed due to these due to ICE implementing these horrific policies at the border. But we do have to move on to another quick story because we're going to be entering into our second hour very soon, and I, and I want to cover this. So, look, I'm an active runner. Um, I like to exercise. I like to breathe the fresh morning air. I mean, look, I, you know, I, I, got, I got to stay in shape. So uh, yesterday um, I go to the park to, to, to go run, and all of a sudden I, I, it felt like I couldn't breathe. I felt like this huge wave of asphalt or production or smoke hit my face, even though I couldn't see it. And it's, uh, it's this asphalt plant that's being built at uh, 2000 block of West Pershing Road in the Chicago McKinley Park neighborhood. Now, this matte asphalt plant was built without the citizens of the 12th Ward. Uh, it was built without them knowing about it. And the alderman basically ref- uh, failed to inform the, his, his constituents that there's going to be an asphalt plant that's going to be built in our community. So for the people who live in... Uh, Brighton McKinley Park, Park, McKinley Park, and Little Village, uh, all of them make up the 12th Ward, and basically we have this, um, I guess, quote-unquote, well-built facility uh, in in the 12th Ward community. Now, so look, welcome your newest neighbor. Yeah, welcome our newest neighbor. Now, again, a huge, uh, again, to Mayor Rahm Emanuel, you know, you, you say you want to make the city green and efficient and safe, um, but this plant was built without the people knowing about it. The Illinois uh, state EPA uh, f- only just recently sent out a letter to the constituents of the 12th Ward that this asphalt plant was going to be built. And, uh, again, it's, it, it seems ironic and disappointing that this, this plant is, again, built and no one really is asking any questions about it. So, thankfully, two organizations have actually stepped up to, um, you know, trace this uh this facility's impact on the environment on the air water and soil and there are the 12th ward ipo and the mckinley park progressive alliance and so what these organizations are doing they set up these uh air monitors and uh they've been documenting and uh you know taking film of this uh asphalt plant and it's really depressing to see this uh facility being built because i couldn't run i know i took a couple of photos like what's what, what one photo that really stands out the most is and you could see it on our facebook page or instagram page uh, there's a garden, like you know, the children use to, to to grow food or flowers or nice little plants and everything. Is it a and, community garden. Yeah, right? it's, it's like a community garden. Okay. And right behind it is this asphalt plant, right there. You see, you see the three different silos. You see the smoke chimney. Mm. You see the American flag flying up there too. Of course. And it, it, I, it, after taking the, and we'll talk about the toxic tour in a second hour, but I I don't trust this facility. I don't think they followed through with the rules and regulations. They built this thing up really fast within a year. And I know they had to have cut corners. And, you know, when the alderman says there's nothing to worry about. Uh, that's exactly th- when you got to worry. That, that's when you have mm-hmm. to panic. Look, to the, to the entire city government of the city of Chicago, all the aldermen and the Cook County commissioners and even you, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, Chicago has a long, sad history of corrupt elected officials. Your current body does not inspire confidence, trust, or loyalty. It's, you know, corruption is, is Chicago politics MO. Like, that's what, we, that's what you guys are known for, all right? And you could say that you're good people and that you're trying your best, but the thing is, this plant was built without the people knowing about it. The alderman failed. Mayor Rahm Emanuel, you should pull the 12th Ward uh, alderman into your office and ask him, hey, why was this built? I mean, you, you say you want the city to be green and efficient, but, uh, you know, where, where's the accountability? And, and Nothing what, says uh, green and efficient like an asphalt plant in a residential neighborhood. Yeah, right. with, with, with a park and a swimming pool that people use. Don't tell me that you didn't know, and don't tell me that all the regulations were put into place. And it, it, even if it was, why did you choose a residential area to build an asphalt plant? You know, it, it's, it's, it's stupid, it's dumb, and it's really insulting to the voting populace. And this is why in 2019, 
all of us need to get actively involved and, and elect these uh, and make sure we elect people that will represent the people. And we got to get rid of these corrupt officials. And, uh, you know, uh, again, I got to ask, why was this built? Why well, there are a few avenues to this, right? Yeah. So it sounds on the surface a little bit like sort of a NIMBY complaint, right? Not in my backyard. Yeah. Yeah, and it kind of is that. But first, citizens in the neighborhood weren't informed about it. Nope. We aren't confident that these environmental regulations uh, are being – these standards are being met. And why would you put an asphalt plant in the city of Chicago in a residential area? I could tell like you why, that, too. That population density is very high. Like, it's – yeah, it's not in my backyard, but – there are plenty of places in this state where you could build an asphalt plant that didn't have a population density like that. This is why Gary, Indiana exists. This is where you put. Well, this these is why things. West Calumet right. exists. Yeah. This is why East Chicago exists. And on top of it, too, look, look. This is also a form of environmental racism, too, because now that this plant is being built. It's don't tell me that the fumes will not impact people. Don't tell me that people aren't going to be sick or that they're going to start acting up or their home values will drop. Yeah, and and mm-hmm. and once and once you you know, we've seen this gentrification policy play out in Pilsen, South Austin, Inglewood and all other working class communities here in the city of Chicago. Once the uh, I guess quote unquote the bad people move out, you, it, they it, they tear down the plant, they buy <laughs> you have these yeah. huge real estate developers that have influence over the city government. That's right, Alderman, I'm calling you out again cuz you guys are bought and sold. Yep. Uh you know, uh, they, 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 these large real estate developers move in. They then gentrify the community, and then all of a sudden, it seems like a nice place to live. Doesn't that sound it's, great? There's a very specific setup that this happens with gentrification. Step one: put something into the community that disrupts the community, and generally speaking, lowers land values and lowers health values. Or you can do the another path, which is remove schools. You can yeah. either you can do either the health avenue or the education avenue. You let that play out, the neighborhood starts to deteriorate, homes are worth less, its quality of life is less, people that already don't have a lot have even less, and then once things get cheap enough and enough people leave, you have, at that time, you have real estate buy up certain areas of land Mm -hmm. until they get a big enough uh, area that they, they get that area and they completely redevelop it, they give it all the things that the people that lived in those areas were asking for for decades but never received because the government didn't care. Yeah. And then, but now that those people are gone, now that is built back up. So then you have schools that are nice, you have hospitals, you have restaurants, you have banks, you have all this. And so then you get a new influx of people that come in that are uh, gentrifying that area, and then that increases land value. So then you have people that don't make a lot of money living in terrible conditions in the same neighborhood next to people who are making a lot more money in nicer conditions, which causes the people that don't have a lot, their land value to raise, which then causes the people that are there, most of them then have to are forced to leave because they can't afford rent because it's gone up so much because of their property taxes because of these wealthier areas adjacent in the same property tax district. So they're forced to leave and you keep doing that. Yeah. You keep building up that area. You keep making it a larger and larger part. And then you have more people come in because it becomes nicer. And then if you yeah. make over fifty thousand dollars, it's a nicer place to live. More people move in, which causes the land values to go up even more, yeah. which causes property taxes to go up even more. So which the rest of the people that are there are slowly and methodically kicked out because you can't just it's not like China. You can't just say, Get out of your house, we're bulldozing the city and making building it better and brand new. It's America. So you economically force people to make their own decision even though you force them to do to move out. So then right. once they're all pushed out, you rebuild the entire area. And now you have a nice new part of the city that people that make more money can live. So in a sense, it's a shift that causes gentrification through economic forces. Right. And so with that being said, uh, 12th Ward, Alderman, George Cardenas. Uh, my only question is, why was this built, and what did you offer? What kind of tax incentives were offered to this uh, asphalt plant to be built in the McKinley Park residential area? Um, and other how than, much did he personally profit? Yeah, exactly. And again, sorry, sorry, city government, you don't inspire confidence. You have a long, yeah. sad history of corruption. The default is yeah. someone took money. Yeah, chan- and so and if, so. If, that, if you and, had to bet, it's always going to be right. Took and, money. And, the, and the main point is the main point is though is that. Uh, we need to start holding these elected officials accountable. And other than that, we're going to go into the second uh, hour. We're going to right now have our break. Uh, so if you like what we do, we have a Patreon page. Other than that, uh, peace to everyone. Let's see you guys in the second hour with our special guest, Jimmy Dore. 
And we are back. Welcome to the second hour of Hard Lens Media. We got a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, we have our special guest, Jimmy Dore, who will be joining us a little bit uh, nearing the end of the second hour. And uh, right now, me and Daniel have a very important story to talk to you guys about. And it's something that we covered uh, while we were also covering socialism in 2018, and that is the toxic tour in Indiana. Now, just to get, let you guys know, we were well, one, uh, a long time ago in 2016, me and Daniel were in the East Calumet or West Calumet, uh, East Chicago community. And this is an area that was built on top of a lead refinery center. But we also had the opportunity to interview and speak to Thomas Frank, who gave us more of a background and history of the entire Gary, Indiana, East Chicago, Indiana community and its environmental impact in the Midwest. There's a whole lot to get into. We've, and, we, and we've interviewed Thomas Frank before in the past. So, yeah. so you can check out that interview, that, that we've, especially when he's been East, on our show. When so. it comes down to it, East Chicago, it's all in Indiana. It's just an environmental disaster. So there's so much to get into. I know we don't have a lot of time to cover this story, but let's dive into it. Right. So so uh, let, let me actually get started. Like, right now, currently, we have our team editing some of these videos. It's like six hours of content. It will be up on the Harlands Media YouTube channel and Twitter account and Facebook page. So we'll definitely let you guys know when it's out there. But it's very important that we share this because our entire ecosystem is being affected. We have the... These large industrial facilities, U.S. Steel, BP, they are unregulated because Indiana has a history of lax regulations. It's very laissez-faire. And so what's happening is that you have these power plants and facilities that are basically dumping regulated, quote-unquote, regulated toxic waste into our water system. I want to give a little background on that. So Indiana is very special in how they deal with environmental regulations. So when they say regulated, it means, hey, you can't just put that toxic material in the water. That's ridiculous. you got to mix it with water first. Then you can put it in the lake. So what we dealt with when we've been there, we last time we were there, Calumet existed as a housing project. Of course, it was an area where it was polluted with lead levels 280 times what was considered safe. And, of course, they put uh, black and brown people in those areas because who else are you going to put in but minorities when you have a racist government that's in the area? So they were there. Everyone there, of course, had cancers. Um, their, their hair was falling out. just a terrible place to live. And they knew about it. The government had known about it for years. So finally, when they decided to kick everyone out, they well, first tried to kick them out with no waivers, not trying to help them relocate. Um, work by Thomas Frank and a couple other uh, news sources helped change that. But at this point, um, it's still exactly what it was. It's still an area. In fact, that, worse. It's, yeah. So we, we saw a lot of things there. And so just going through the toxic tour, we had four different areas where we had active pipeline leaks of various kinds you had um the river itself is so polluted that if you just stand and watch it for uh 30 seconds to a minute every 30 seconds to a minute you will see a plume of oil pop up from the bottom of the river and that's people's drinking water and 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 we use that for everything and the important thing is that because it's indiana it is on the coast so what they do is they push that all into lake michigan so that's why when you see your report that the city will send you or whatever township you're in You'll have the, like, why is there, like, beryllium in my water? It's from the uh, U.S. steel furnace. Now, to give an idea of scale, the blast furnace that runs to make the – that runs the U.S. steel is the largest in the Western Hemisphere. Mm-hmm. They have the largest tar sands refinery in the U.S. They have drums of uh, jet fuel and oil that – some of which don't even have a bottom, so they leak right into the soil and they contaminate the groundwater. You have the entire all the groundwater for the most part has been contaminated with pollutants. You've yeah. had uh, oil spill after oil spill happen. You have s- piles of slag and just disgusting metals that are put a co- couple hundred feet from the lake that are actively blowing dust from right. these and, contaminants and, and, and into and the lake. Let's actually let everyone understand this. Like, look, we interviewed the Chicago Surfers Organization here in the city of Chicago. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have an ongoing lawsuit with U.S. Steel. They were recently surfing in Lake Michigan, and their entire team came out breaking out with hives and rashes all over their body due to the fact that we have this these, this chemical waste being dumped into our lake. So we all know that Chicago has lead in its water, all right? It's, 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 there's no debate. There's no talk. Like right now, that this is a current situation. What's happening in Flint, Michigan, the city of Chicago, a major metropolitan city, has to deal with. But we also have another problem. When these large industrial facilities dump this regulated toxic waste into the lake, the current that's in the lake pushes it right back towards the city of Chicago. So we're drinking that stuff. It's yeah, coming don't right forget, back at us. We get our us. water from Lake Michigan. We have aquifers that feed the entire city. Right. And yeah. on, t- on top of that, too, all the dust, all the smoke and pollutants that are being put into the air 
the air currents up up in Gary, Indiana, East Chicago, uh, Indiana communities, it blows right back into the city of Chicago. So we're breaching it in. See, when the city of Chicago was you know making pushing out all the industry, they were pushing all this industry into the Indiana, so they wouldn't have to worry about it. The problem is all the byproduct is still coming right back at us, and and, and with the lack of regulations and protections. Um, People are going to get sick. Like the people of Indiana, northern Indiana, are already affected by it, but we're going to be hit by it too. So we're already getting hit by it. Yeah. And I think it's important to realize that even though it's in Indiana, all that area is under Chicago's zone of influence. So Chicago, this is Chicago's industry that's just been moved to another state. So like we were covering previously in the first in the first hour, how Chicago is calls itself a sanctuary city, but Emmanuel is actively deporting immigrants. They're just doing it in Indiana. It's the same kind of deal. It's a deal so that you can have a political conversation where you can say, hey, we're not doing this. Mm-hmm. Someone else is, even though you put the deal together. You know, to it's allow literally it next door. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and also, we also captured a huge environmental and I guess uh, – I don't know what else, I guess, a hazard, a construction hazard yeah, so, that we saw firsthand. So, so I'm going I'm to hand yeah. it to Daniel because he, he can go into more detail about it because he's a, a lead contractor. Yeah. Uh, we managed to go to the East Chicago, West Calumet community. Well, what and, was left of well, it. What was remaining of it. And we saw these you know, large construction vehicles digging up the soil, and you know, they're throwing all this plume of air in, in, uh, up in there. So look. The soil contaminants, like with ninety, is way above. So let me yeah, let me hear those numbers. Yeah. Let's, let's go a little. Okay, so in the area, this is a, just as a clarification. This is the same EPA that manages Flint, Michigan. Manages in quotations. So the natural soil, they say, it's lead is you know it's in the environment. So if it's two hundred parts per million or less in the soil, that's fine. That's a natural occurrence of lead. If it's over four hundred parts per million, that's a safety hazard. We got to deal with it. West Calumet, which was a housing project with kids and families, had 90,000 parts per million in the soil. And, again, that's why all these people have all these health issues. Not just lead. We're just saying lead, but it's also arsenic. It's a whole bunch of but other – they were digging out the skeletal so, remains so, of the facility. So what happened was East Calumet, they decided to destroy the entire uh, – uh, the, the area where all these people – again, we, they kicked them out. They didn't give them enough when they forced them to leave. But either way – once they r- kick them out, then they're like, okay, we got to destroy this entire place. Now, what's interesting is the housing that was built in that area was all uh, flat. There's no basements anywhere. The only buildings that would have a basement in them were part of the former U.S. lead refiner that used to be there uh, a couple decades ago. So when we got there, uh, we were driving around with Thomas Frank, who was showing us on the text for all these different areas of pollution. We were by the school that and we was were, shut down. Then we were by the school that was shut down. Um, and actually when we were filming this part, we were near a neighborhood that within – we counted five kids within a, two blocks of when we filmed this. Yeah. But what we saw was we popped there. We put up. We started recording. They were digging up the actual um, a basement a vault that was, be, that was formerly used by U.S. lead. So we're talking an area that already is 90,000 parts per million. We're talking about an actual unit that, part, that was part of this lead refinery and with no containment field – no water suppression, no hazmat, no hazmat suits, suits yeah. no breathing masks, nothing to deal with it. They're just digging it up with an excavator, and they knew that that was illegal. They knew it because as soon as they saw us filming, they shut down the entire construction site. It was it was pretty funny to see that because like you, they all hid too. Like one guy was hiding inside his little, little, in the yeah. cab. Of because the, they the know that what they did, what we filmed, was probably <laughs> if the EPA had any teeth, was at least a half a million dollar fine because they are digging up contaminants that are. Filled with lead, they are putting it in. There's just dust blowing everywhere. So you have dust blowing right into the neighborhood where kids are playing, mm-hmm. two or three blocks away. So they're breathing it in, and, and we were breathing the, it in too. And the construction workers, and were that's the thing. The in. construction workers, they have no idea what danger they're in. They or, don't understand how dangerous this lead is. They don't understand yeah. the concentration of lead that is in their bodies. Yeah. Again, lead is more less dangerous as you age. But even as an adult, they're dealing with probably over a hundred thousand parts per million that they're just in that they're dealing with on a daily basis so these guys that are i'm probably not getting even paid enough they probably aren't even getting health insurance they're probably just subcontractors are going to have 
life-altering effects because they're dealing with lead so much they're in areas that that's just riddled with it with no respirator masks, no hazmat suits, which, again, goes against OSHA. They're digging up a containment facility that's going to have more concentration of lead than the surrounding area, which is already 280 times what it needs to be in terms of concentration. They don't know that they've just impacted their entire lives or they're not thinking about it because their and job their depends families on too. it. And their families, and their families too, be too because they're going to bring that home. But the thing is when you kick up that dust, you see just – plumes of dust like a dust storm because lead is fantastic at turning into dust it's one of the biggest issues when i do renovations we have to make sure anything we touch is completely soaked with water so that there's no chance any amount of dust can get anywhere we have to do an entire containment unit so that it can't blow anywhere it is such a dangerous material and they're just cavalier just digging it up and they know it's wrong because as soon as they saw us with the camera they shut down the entire thing yeah if, I, if I, I was I, a betting man I, I would say all of those workers probably signed waivers saying they wouldn't sue the company that's that's most likely the the chance especially in indiana where again they are very pro-business very laissez-faire because you know we we, we we saw some sites there too especially in whiting indiana uh you know it's mm-hmm. almost seemed like something from outer limits the twilight zone or even black mirror we see these large industrial facilities, and then right in front of it, it's almost like a picturesque small town Americana, a beautiful beachfront, um, kids playing in the water, nice little mom and pop stores everywhere. But just right behind it, you have this the the I think what's a BP. Uh, the BP refinery. You had the that's hundred foot. You had the hundred foot uh, slag mountain. Yeah, that's just yeah. blowing right into the air. They don't understand. It's like they're they're being paid a lot. So the workers that work for BP are being paid about a hundred thousand dollars. So as long a year. as they get theirs, they don't care. Yeah, they don't. They're not thinking about the health consequences of their family. Most of those people, they don't know. It. In twenty years time, thirty years time. They're going to be just like the people of East Chicago. They're around it so much. Yeah. It may look nice. It may look picturesque. It may make them feel like they're not a part of this area, but they're every day. They, them and their families are breathing in you, you stuff could, that's killing them. You couldn't pay me enough to swim in Lake Michigan now. I have a lot of fond memories of visiting Michigan City, Indiana, going to Indiana State Dunes, but there's no way you can get me in that water. I actually took some B-roll footage. Uh, I went all the way up to the pier, and I catch her in the background, the industrial facilities, and then I slowly turn to this beautiful small town, uh, you know, right there, the beautiful mask, and then, then also turn right onto the people playing in the beach water, and then we're way in the distance, our beautiful city, the city of Chicago. Um, look, the fact that for such a long time the state government uh, and even the federal government has been turning a blind eye to this, it shows you that we're going to be dealing with the consequences of what's happening in East Chicago, Indiana, Gary, Indiana, Whiting, Indiana. We're dealing with it, and our water is very precious. Like, if we contaminate this lake continuously, like, we won't be able to use it anymore. We're destroying the ecosystem. We're destroying its, uh, its, val- its, its value as something that we'll need in the future. Look, climate change is a scientific fact. There's, there's no arguing with it now. It's, it's impacting human societies. The rest of the international community is developing plans and measures to deal with climate change. But if... If we don't put put some form of environmental protections and regulations uh, on these companies, we won't be able to use Lake Michigan and this large body of fresh water. One of the just, most important yeah, yeah. deposits of fresh water on the planet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's 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 depressing the fact that we're that this is continuing that this is continuing, and we will do another part two of the toxic tour. Right now, we have a good team that's dedicating a lot of time to really uh, make sure this content is out. Uh, when it is out, please share it because in the name of humanity, we have to protect our uh, watersheds, our rivers, and our lakes. Other than that, uh, we are going to introduce our special guest of the second hour, none other than the great Jimmy Dore. He is the host. Oh, yeah, right here. Uh, uh, he is the host of uh, the Jimmy Dore Show, Aggressive Progressive, and he's also a commentator on the main show, The Young Turks. And he has a touring comedian who has a uh, show coming out tomorrow. Yeah. Welcome to Hardlands Media. It's good to meet you again for the third time. It's good to see you. Uh, yeah, we're doing a live show tomorrow in um, at Thalia Hall, which is a new place. It's in Pilsen, which is where I uh, lived when I was starting out as a comedian wow. in the early 90s here in Chicago, which, what was that, about 55 years ago now? And, um <laughs> So, yeah, it's fantastic. Thanks for having me. Um, thanks for depressing me with the poison story. I really yeah. appreciate oh, that, uh, too. Well, just well, I'm actually going to add one more uh, <laughs> pressure, of, uh, one more thing of depression. It's going to be in Pilsen. Your, your show is going to be at, correct? Yeah, correct. Uh, well, Pilsen, we've been, we've been doing a lot of coverage in Pilsen, and in, in that community alone, 10,000 people have been d- displaced due to the gentrification that's happening in 
the Pilsen community. We've talked to the Pilsen Alliance, the 25th Ward IPO, and for the most part, our wonderful mayor, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, and the <laughs> aldermen He's fantastic. Are, are, just, yeah. are just basically helping out the large real estate developers. But there is some pushback. We're seeing the community stand up but again a lot of people have already been impacted a lot in pilsen so yeah, yeah. i know yeah it's i mean that's that's the story all over the country yeah. right now so there's no affordable housing i live in los angeles where people they have a term for it where you uh i know what they call food insecure but something about rent when you you're supposed to pay a third of your income in housing like that's the max but in california you pay like 50 percent and it's really screwing up people's uh, family budgets, and there's no plan to fix any of it. No one's – they're still building, you know, million-dollar high-rise condominiums and uh, right in the shadow of, uh, you know, homeless people, tent, tent cities and stuff like that. Yeah. So we, we have a serious homeless problem here in the city of Chicago too, even though Mayor Emanuel says that there isn't one. <laughs> yeah. I, again, he's, he's, he's doing a good job, according to Hillary Clinton during the 2016 primary. Yeah, he's doing <laughs> – <laughs> yeah, he's doing, he's doing a great job. He's doing a great. I hope. I, hopefully, he'll par- privatize the sewer caps next or something. <laughs> well, Is I, there anything I think they redid that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, look, he's he's already privatized a lot of stuff. He's he's also shut down fifty schools under under his yeah. watch, and now four more, especially in the Inglewood community. So. Well, you know, you guys sound like Putin puppets. <laughs> you know what? To God, if, if, you, if you say bad things about the Democratic Party, you're just a bad person. Oh yeah. well, yeah. We, no, for I, sure. Well, well, wait, wait ahead of you, Jimmy. We're, we've been talking a lot <laughs> yeah. of crap about no, the Democratic if, Party if that's the for, case, for, we, for we a very long time. I mean, Come on, you guys. We're supposed to unite against Trump. That's the whole point. The only bad thing in the world is Trump right now. That's it. We're not supposed to talk about the system that got us Trump. We're just supposed to talk about Trump and ignore mm-hmm. all the horrible stuff. Eric Holder just tweeted out something I wanted to show you because um, he's such a horrible tool. <laughs> uh, uh, there, you know, Eric, Eric Holder, he's one of the big reasons why we got Trump. He tweeted out, Eric Holder uh, calls to abolish ICE are a gift to Republicans. That's what Eric Holder says. Calls to abolish ICE are a gift to Republicans. I guess he also looked at prosecuting Wall Street as a gift to Republicans because mm-hmm. he didn't do that He didn't either. do that. Nope. Yeah, you yeah. should have been here in the first hour. We were going all out on how what ICE is just a mess, what the entire country is How right ICE now. is a mess and also how uh, the fact that you have that guy Crowley still on the ballot even though Alexandria Ocasio uh, defeated him fair and squarely. So and, yeah. people still you know, wag their finger – at uh, people who wouldn't support the corporatist warmonger Hillary Clinton, uh, as if that would have made everything better. Uh, her her policies were about I don't know one percent better uh, than the worst really? president we've ever had. I, Maybe because I, I don't think so. I don't I think, think she was ever really that. I think she was just the same kind of person. Remember, they they encouraged him to run. No, there's no doubt. You know what? You might be right. Uh, <laughs> like, like I said, Trump at least is incompetent in how he acts. Hillary knew how to use the levers of power, and so even if she's slightly better, she makes her much worse. So why do you think people get away? Why do you think no one um, ever wags their finger at the Clinton campaign for doing the Pied Piper strategy or or the MSNBC media that propped up Trump or even, um, you know, Les Moonves is on uh, open microphone cheering Trump's ride. He says, you know, Trump is bad for America, but he's good for CBS's profits. So run, Donald, run. And everyone laughs. No one ever points their finger at powerful people who made Donald Trump happen. All they have is voter shaming. One of the reasons why I think people still have their glasses on uh, the fact that uh, Clinton was a good president or even Hillary was a good senator is the fact of his administration there was a uh, I guess budgetary surplus and that he was better than George Bush senior and all this other stuff they, there, there was a lot of assumptions that he was doing a good job when in fact it was under Bill Clinton's uh, watch that the corporations were able to buy up the media in the 1996 uh, telecommunication act, act, yeah, the telecommunication act yeah. and then NAFTA and a few other things. Yeah, a lot too. of what we're yeah. dealing with right now, people don't want to say. I think that as time goes on, it will continue because people are already starting to dislike Bill Clinton in a way that he didn't expect ten years ago. And I think Obama is going to follow the same kind of path that mm-hmm. people move farther away from him. Is that first you have people that have lived their entire lives in propaganda, especially if they lived through the Cold War and they've had their minds altered in a certain way to react to stimuli in a very specific way. That's almost a push button that the government and media can do. And if people believe in power, it just kind of, it's a very easily to make self perpetuating cycle. But now we're in an area where, especially with the internet. Um, different organizations that can challenge the power that you're talking about. There's all these different voices, which, of course, the mainstream media calls fake news. This is a challenge directly to their power. But that's only lasting for a while. That's why you have Fox's media in age at 72. You have CNN's at 70. You have MSN's at 68. The power that they have gained through that lifetime and that certain 
viewpoint is literally dying off and it's being replaced by people with different points of views. They don't get their news from CNN. They don't get their news from Fox. They don't get their news from any other mainstream show. They're all on the internet. The business model itself, we were talking in the previous hour, the business model itself of television is dying fast. The only reason that they're going with Trump is they know that they're going to – TV is dying. It's a dying industry. The question is when. It's the way it's set up. It's going to collapse very quickly when it collapses. You already have uh, more money from last year from advertisers going into the internet than is going on TV. So that business model is already falling apart. So they're just grasping which at is, straws. Which is why the establishment news media is trying every as hard as they can to discredit YouTube. Yeah. And independent news media. And that's why they are talking about fake news even more than Donald Trump talks about fake news. And it's all about propaganda. So when Donald Trump talks about it, it's propaganda. And when CNN talks about fake news, by the way, their apple banana thing, how many freaking bananas did they tell us was an apple already? A bunch. Yeah. And it seems like every other month they have to retract a story about Russiagate and they have to admonish their reporters and somebody goes on. And so uh, CNN is propaganda just as MS. Are you telling yeah. me that Rachel Maddow doesn't have appeal to the kids that's yeah. what's funny well, they're all friends, friends too much money to care. they are all friends with each other same thing like how the democrat and republican establishment are all friends with well, each other well rachel madoff famously uh said that he, after roger ailes died she called him a friend yeah <laughs> a guy who was one of the biggest uh, rapey uh, sexual harassers in the world he would cut he would uh, drop his pants in front of women and say give me a uh, can i swear on her uh, no. Actually, no. no. So unfortunately, okay. we have the demon that's called the FCC. Over oh, this is right. this is on the radio. Yes. Yeah. Oh, this is fantastic. Then. Look at that. I'm <laughs> also on the radio, so I know how that is. Yeah. Yeah. So, Luckily, it'll be on YouTube as well. Yeah. So, I think yeah. it's funny to hear a bunch of guys uh, on the radio talking about TV being a dead media. But anyway, <laughs> touche. Touche. You got. But that, there is hey, a, that's why we put this on the internet. Yes. Yeah. 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 But there is there is there is a question I do want to ask you, and this is like way back in 2016, before we even started this. This is when I was still a viewer and. And you're just, just sitting down, not doing anything. So during the 2016 election cycle, uh, in both the primary and the general election, you were one of the main people that was really critical of how the elections were being covered, especially with how the DNC establishment worked with the Clinton campaign to commit election fraud to, de- to deny Bernie Sanders the nomination. Uh, from your experience covering that election cycle uh, with your show and being a, a, a commentator on TYT, when was the moment you realized that this election will not go the way corporate media was reporting on it? Um, I, you know, I didn't know. I also didn't think Donald Trump was going to win. I, I, I'm not, so I'm not that smart. I'm not a good predictor, I, I guess. You, you called a lot of things out, and they did turn out they were going to happen. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's just obvious, and if people don't want to see it, it's just that's not because they're not smart. It's because they don't have the courage to face reality, right? So the people who said that we had to prop up Donald um, Hillary Clinton over Donald Trump – and we had to play the – that's literally the game Hillary Clinton planned, literally. She knew she was repulsive. She knew – they knew in 2008 that half the country wouldn't vote for her. Mm-hmm. So Christopher Dodd stood up at a debate, a Democratic debate in the primary in 2008 or 2007, I guess, is when they had those debates. And he said 50 percent of the country won't vote for Hillary Clinton. I'm not telling you any something that nobody else up here knows. We all know that, and the party has to recognize that. He said that in 2007, and then eight, uh, eight years later, they go on and nominate that woman, who they knew almost a decade earlier was repulsive to half the country. And so they have to prop up a criminal clown in the other party just so she can get elected. They had to first rig that primary so she could be the only person in the country who could lose the Donald Trump, yet they still want to blame <laughs> Bernie Bros and Jill Stein and Susan Sarandon and Russian memes and 12 Twitter bots and every other, because they don't want you to look at the system that gave you Trump. And anybody who told you, and there's still people who wag their finger and say, oh, you're happy about the Supreme Court? You know, Barack Obama should have sat his Supreme Court nominee, and he didn't. Yeah. Again, the reason why we are here is because of the existential and transparent failure of the Democratic Party. And for them to make you believe that the antidote to Donald Trump is more corporatist, warmongering neoliberals is the biggest lie being told today besides Russiagate. Mm-hmm. And so uh, when, when I saw good progressives cajoling people into a party that was actively working against them and cheating progress how you could call yourself a progressive and tell people to join the democratic party not only that but wag your finger at people for not supporting corporatists who take corporate money uh that's when you've lost your way and so i i 
they're still doing it, by the way. If we don't get a third party, things will continue to get worse. Do you think half the country is going to be excited to vote for another corporatist for Kamala Harris or Cory Booker? Mm -hmm. They're not going to be excited. It's the same crap as Hillary Clinton. So, you know, the whole thing about elective politics is you're supposed to go out and garner votes. And if you don't have enough votes to win, you're supposed to go earn someone votes. You know, one is owed. You don't owe your vote to anybody. They're supposed to earn it. Half the country didn't vote. And if Hillary Clinton wanted to win that election, maybe she should have spoke to those people. You know, the New York Times did a great article right after the 2016 election. They went to Milwaukee. They went to barber shops uh, where uh, minorities didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. Uh, she, they interviewed barbers. Uh, four of them uh, all voted for Barack Obama twice. These four didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. Two of them didn't bother to vote. The other two wrote in someone else's name. And that's how bad Barack Obama let people down. That's how bad the Democratic Party. So, again, this is what we should be doing is doing an autopsy on the Democratic Party. And that is not happening. And all the people who, go, who continue to wag their finger like John Q. Hey, have you ever had John Cusack on your show? Oh, yeah, plenty. He's been every week. Yeah, yeah. We, we have him here. He always tells us to fall in line and how dare we uh, think something. It's, it's a very nice conversation. No, yeah, we'd love to have him on the show, though. <laughs> yeah. I, well, you know, I mean, the guy, uh, he, I don't know how he could do gross point blank and then tweet. He's so, he's being such a knucklehead right now. And I like John Cusack, and mm. I could kick his ass in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll, we'll join you, man. Hey, us outsiders has got to stick together. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, he's, a, he's, he's taller than me, but I could drop him. No problem. Okay. Yeah, I no, could drop him. No problem. You know, when we were... Uh, and this is not me trying to bait him into a fight so I could sue him. No, but if you do it, we will film it for you. Yeah, oh, I appreciate yeah, it. We'll, we'll film it. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll do whatever needs to be done. But uh, I am not trying to bait him into taking a swing at me so I could sue him. That's not what I'm doing. No, Paul, I know you got some. I hope answer. he doesn't take a swing at me. Yeah, I want to do it. Um, <laughs> but he could come to my show at Dahlia Hall and take a swing at me. That would be As fantastic. long as he pays the ticket, that's yeah. the important part. Now, you know what? I would actually uh, comp him. Oh, nice. Okay. okay there no, I'm a big, such a big fan of John Cusack's. And this, you know, Trump really excites the lizard brain of a lot of people, and he's one of them. Yeah. And so what, what Ron Placone says on my show, and I can't stop repeating it, is, you know, I'm as repulsed by Donald Trump as the next guy, but I'm not going to let him steal my critical thinking skills. Exactly. And that's what a lot of people do. People like mm -hmm. people I respect, Keith Olbermann, uh, foaming at the mouth maniac about Trump and set, instead of the system that brought us Trump. Yeah. And he admitted that he would actually he would like to have Pence as president. No. He, he said this at, on The View, and he said... And 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 uh, uh, he said, even though a lot of his uh, uh, more right wing policies would get passed under Pence, I'd still want to have him. And you know why? That's because he's an out of touch millionaire who the policies of the government doesn't really affect him. So this is all about his ego. So if he really cared about policies hurting people, he wouldn't want to impeach him and put Pence in. This is all about millionaire. Uh, um, what do they call him? Uh, narcissists. Mm -hmm. Millionaire narcissists have a personal problem with. Donald Trump. And that's what this. Hey, I have a problems with Donald Trump, too. Let's think about the best way to defeat him. And you know what the best way to defeat him is? It's not foaming at the mouth, telling people how dumb he is. The way is, is to actually offer voters something to come out and vote for, which they still won't do. Here, here. Here, here. Uh, Paul, I know you Yeah, I wanted question. to switch gears slightly. You mentioned something a little bit earlier, and it's um, something that I've been talking about. For, we've all been talking about for the last 18 months or so, and it's Russiagate. Right. I've disliked. I've been skeptical of this story from the beginning. I dislike the way it's presented. The accusations are all over the place. It was these emails. No, it was those emails. No, it was Don Jr. meeting with someone. No, it was this. No, it was that. Definitely Russia. Definitely collusion. And we're like, where's the evidence? Show us what your actual what is the real accusation? and What can we really get behind? Because, yes, I, mean, I agree. A foreign government interfering with our election process should be handled. We should. That's a big deal. On Friday, just yesterday. Mueller gave us 12 indictments of Russians, right? 12 it's, Russians who will never see it, uh, uh, the light of court. Never. It's, again, it's the same. They, they indicted 12 t Twitter trolls. They, now they indict 12 people. Again, with zero evidence. It's all about the assessment of the intelligence community. And here's why you know they'll never be a prosecution in this that has anything to do with treason. Tre treason or, it's because the hack of the emails happened on the DNC server the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security was not allowed access to those servers. Mm -hmm. So we will never 
ever have proof of that. And why do you think – so if, you, if someone broke into your house – You'd want the cops to come in your house to investigate it. Well, the Democratic National Committee did not want that to happen. So right there, you know they're lying liars who cheat. And that's what this is. This is propaganda, cheating, the Russian narrative. You know, I've talked about it on my show. They did internal polling for Hillary Clinton before the election. And they found out Hillary Clinton's biggest vulnerability was her tie to Russia. Because Bill Clinton got half a million dollars from a Russian bank mm-hmm. to give one speech, and then she did the, the, uh, the Uranium One deal. Yeah. And they, they, they in Hillary Clinton's own campaign, did internal polling, and they found out that was her greatest vulnerability when people found out about her ties to Russia, that it really changed their votes. So what do you do, Machiavelli taught us that what do you do, is you take your biggest weakness, you throw it on your opponent, and that's exactly what's happening, and because people hate Trump, they'll let their critical thinking skills uh, go away, and they'll just repeat establishment propaganda. This is exactly how McCarthyism happened. Go watch Good Night and Good Luck. It was, it was the whole country, just like it's happening now, right. doing it. And it was uh, just a few people standing up telling the truth, and they would get fired for it. They would lose their job for it, just like it's happening now. But so, this is an interesting take on the indictments that likely you're not going to get any of these Russian government officials to actually show up in court. They'll never show so up. So we may never actually see this evidence they claim they have. But uh, So a lot of folks that will tell me that I'm the conspiracy theorist for being skeptical of this claim. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so when you're debunking a conspiracy, they call you a conspiracy theorist. They go, Jimmy Dore doesn't go along with the Russia Gate, so he's a conspiracy. No, that's a conspiracy theory, Russia Gate. Mm-hmm. I'm debunking it. So people don't even know. They've been so brainwashed that they don't even know what they're saying. Well, they don't know what they're saying at if all. we'll ever see the evidence then we have something to talk about but you're right we may not in this case that's just really a really fascinating do you think so what people bring up is Mueller doesn't dish out indictments willy-nilly like he does that when he's got evidence yes and we've he gotten, does uh, okay turns out he does turns out maybe that's the case okay it turns out he's a liar he turns out he lied the country he was one of the guys who lied to congress and the country into uh, the iraq war that's who robert Mueller is mm-hmm. he's one of the he's one of our head spooks which means he's a big liar yeah, yeah paid liar a, he's a paid liar so that's right. who robert Mueller is he doesn't have integrity None of these guys do. The guys, t- t- so uh, yeah, the FBI, they're so full of integrity. Hey, why don't you go infiltrate Black Lives Matter again? Why don't you go infiltrate Occupy Wall Street again? Why don't you go plant uh, evidence on the Black Panthers again? Why don't you, go, I mean, that's who the FBI is. Let's not forget who these people are, mm-hmm. right? Um, so they're, they're, they didn't go, they didn't, they're not Boy Scouts. These are people who are criminals, half of them themselves, and a half turn away. Robert Mueller's a criminal. Robert Mueller lied to us about going into Iraq. And I have the video that I love to play on my show. And he, even he doesn't believe what he's saying. He can't even make eye contact. He can't even look up when he's saying it. So let's keep in mind who these people are. Now these people from the CIA get jobs at MSNBC and, NB, and NBC News and CNN. The CIA used to have to infiltrate news organizations. Now they give them uh, $1,000 contracts right up mm-hmm. in front. So, you know, as Chris Hedges said, they're stealing and cheating right out in the open. The oligarchs don't care anymore. They have no shame. Barack Obama, his first entry back into public life was to take half a million dollar speeches to the people that he gave a gift to on Wall Street. That's what his first... After he went parasailing with Richard Branson. He didn't come back to fix... Flint still doesn't have clean water. Mm -hmm. And where's Michelle Obama on that? Doesn't that shock her to her core? No. You know what shocks her to her core? When somebody speaks dirty. That's what shocks her to her core. Not her husband having a kill list. Not her husband having a drone program that kills 90% innocent Americans. What bothers Michelle Obama is when someone speaks in a bad, dirty tone and talks about sex in a gross way. That's what shocks her to her core. Not murders. Not her husband being a war criminal. Not her husband not prosecuting war criminals. Not torture. None of that shocks her to her core. Not the complete complicity of the corrupt media and the cheating of a progressive who could have beat them. None of that shocks Michelle Obama to her core. In fact, Michelle Obama just came out and said, you know what's happened in the election? What's wrong with America's elections is that women don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to vote. She said that. Way to vote her shame. She yeah. did that. She said, women, I'm worried about what's wrong with women. How could, really? So now what Michelle Obama doing is mind effing little girls. She's mm-hmm. making young girls think there's something wrong with women. That's why we have Donald Trump. No, there's something wrong with you specifically, Michelle Obama, and your husband. Something wrong with both of you specifically because you are narcissistic megalomaniacs who sat by and watched kids get poisoned and, 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 in Flint, Michigan and didn't do a damn thing about it. He opened the Arctic, Arctic to drilling twice 
whenever Shell asked him, he let the cops blow the arms off of peaceful protesters in Dakota saying we're going to let it play out. He let cops crack the heads of peaceful protesters who had a a legitimate grievance with their government over Wall Street. He let all that happen. He didn't do anything to help unions. He didn't put on that soft shoe. The problem in America is our corrupt, bought, two-party system. And anybody telling you to join that needs their head examined or is an idiot. Yeah, and you know, the thing is, they're, they're both lawyers. And one thing you did forget is that under Obama's presidency, he got rid of habeas corpus. He repealed habeas corpus, and now we're operating on a liberty view from somewhere around the 1100s. And then he handed all that off. Here's the thing. Trump is such an existential threat. Why would you hand off all that to why wouldn't you reinstate habeas corpus if you think Trump is such a maniac? Right. Why would you expand his spying powers? Why would you do all that? You would try to get rid of all that because it's all one team. And it's all one team and they don't want ever to so that's what and again it, it, it's still you know you John, I can't stop. I just had a Twitter fight with John. I didn't have a Twitter fight with John Cusack. I just told him it was funny to hear him repeat establishment talking points and change the subject so fact it gives you whiplash. And then he said, hey, you're going to come at me, you're going to lose. I go, I'm going to lose what, John? What am I going to lose? <laughs> what, what am I going to lose? My seat at an establishment knuckleheads p- dinner party? I don't want that party. Hey, I'm ser- an outsider, Mr. Hollywood. <laughs> they serve some good food there, though. Yeah. They, they, they serve the good stuff, like those nice little finger yeah. sandwiches. Nice I mean, come on. John, John Cusack proving no one likes to be outlefted. And I'm outlefting him because he's being an establishment tool right now. And uh, he should know better, and he doesn't. And by the way, I'm not trying to get him to take a swing at me, but if he does, I'll be at Thalia Hall, and then I, <laughs> because I need an operation, and I'd like to sue him. <laughs> so, you know, the thing is, because uh, because I, I remember 2016 as well, and I kept on telling my friends and family, like, look, if Clinton gets a nomination, there is a 50-50 chance Trump can win. And, and as soon as I, I said that, you, uh, I said uh, way before she got the nomination, I said just the way it mathed out. Clinton could only be um, Ted Cruz. Everyone else seemed like she would have a struggle. She would lose against. I, I, and I said, like six months out, Trump would beat her in an election. It was. Yeah. It seemed obvious. I mean, everyone that's talking about it is either on the West Coast or the East Coast. You're like, well, everyone around me thinks she's going to win, so therefore she's going to win. But Nate but, Silver told us she would win. Yeah, yeah exactly. But see, but see, Nobody, one, 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 one of the problems, though, that, that that we saw was, especially how the election w- w- was running, was that. Everyone was assuming that she had it in the bag and that she was going to that she was going to win. But th- I, I think I think though, for for people who were calling out this election, uh, we like a lot of us got attacked, like verbally or like like we lost friends because we refused to fall in line or that we were calling out Clinton yeah. for the same amount of hypocrisy that Donald Trump is. And I mean, how Donald dare we yeah. treat people on their merits? Yeah. And, and I, I, you know, because we snuck inside the DNC convention through the front door, no press passes, nothing. That was fun. And you know, <laughs> the, and yeah, we, no, we we we, we went uh, in we, there. I've and, been to both Trump rally, uh, yeah. and I've been to the DNC, and I could not tell the difference. The energy and the antagonism in Trump, it was, oh, you're not a Trump supporter, we're going to antagonize you. And if it was in the DNC, it was, oh, you're not a Clinton supporter, you're a Bernie delegate. We are going to do the same thing. I couldn't tell the people apart. It was the same part of their brain was active, and they were in the same type of group thing. They just thought they were better. Yeah, and, and if you were inside the DNC convention hall, the people say there was peace and love. Outside, we saw Green Party people get assaulted. We saw Bernie Sanders supporters get assaulted. Uh, we spoke to uh, delegates on and off the record how they were physically assaulted. How the threatened. police were yeah. pointing sniper rifles at them. Yeah. But th- this, is, this is getting at a great question because there's a lot of difference of opinion amongst progressives and sort of lefties on this. Is Does the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party, progressive movement, you know, social Democrats, whatever you want to call them, do they try to infiltrate the Democratic Party and steer that giant ship from within – or I know you were big on the draft Bernie movement. Do we do we need to get a third party to actually try and get? No, I think the Democratic Party is willing to reform. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, one thing. One, I mean, do you need? Right? Any, I mean, look at Joe Crowley. Do you need any more? But can we force their hand? Like, yeah. is there enough momentum to force? No, the- I don't think so. I think Bernie's falling in line, and because he's putting all his eggs in the "I'm running in 2020" basket. Mm-hmm. And you know, my question to Bernie is now: if they cheat you again, which they will, and you don't win. 
what have you built over these last four years? Nothing. Right now, I'm, I come from uh, California, the bluest of blue states. We have a supermajority mm -hmm. in our state legislator, and we have a Democratic uh, governor. Do we have single payer? No. We're the fifth largest economy in the world. We don't have single payer. Do we have uh, Do we have free college? No. We don't even have net neutrality, and we have a supermajority. So that so Bernie says, come out and you got to vote and take over the party. We did come out in California, and we did vote our delegates into the party, and overwhelmingly, progressives have more progressive delegates, Bernie delegates, than centrist delegates. We went to the convention. Well, it turns out they have cheaty rules, too. Just like then the national level, they have, uh, super, they have delegates. super delegates. They have super delegates at the state level. They cheated, and they won. And now a pharmaceutical lobbyist is the chairman of the Democratic Party in California. So this is the party. That's the bluest of blue states. And right now we're sending back to, to uh, Washington, D.C., Nancy Pelosi, Kamala Harris, and uh, Dianne Feinstein from the bluest of blue states. So if this is the party Bernie thinks he's taking over, I would like the evidence for it. And I would want to know what he thinks that he's going to accomplish. If he doesn't win the presidency in 2020, what has he built? Instead of him and Tulsi Gabbard and Nina Turner and Ocasio uh, all starting a third party, because that's how you start a third party, you need some big shots from a, the regular party that's corrupted to start a third party. That's how you, and then, so that's why they go, oh, that's why the Greens have had such a hard time taking off, because they haven't had any big time politicians who have celebrity like Bernie or someone like that starting their third party for them. And, you know, people say, well, you can't start it. They just say it like, out with no evidence. They go, well, it's too hard. It's too rigged. You can't do a third party in America, which to me sounds a lot like you can't have single pair in America. It takes a long time. You can't have free. Co Who's going to pay for that? That's what that sounds like. Why does every other Western democracy get to have three, four, or five parties? But in the United States, you can only have two. You know why? Because it's easier to control two parties by the corporation than it is to control three parties as it is to control four parties. And the Greens, everybody likes to say the Greens are disorganized and the Greens aren't a real party. And, and they, the Greens got on the ballot in 48 states. 48 states the Greens got on the ballot. Now, how many states do you need to win? Uh, I don't know, maybe 20 states? You don't need, so they got on 48 states' ballots. So that's super doable. So anybody saying that you, a third party is too hard to start and you can't, they're wrong, 100% wrong. And it's because they've internalized the, the establishment talking points. People saying that we, don't have a, we can't have a third party was thought up by Robbie Mook in some frickin' uh, uh, think tank somewhere, and then people, even lefty journalists, will repeat that. And it's because you've ingested it. And it's not true. And in fact, I'll say this. I, I, I'm not good at predictions, so this will probably be wrong, but my prediction is that if we don't have a third party, things are going to get way worse way fast. Mm. I, I, because I, I, Trump I will be reelected. One yeah. thing that I've said a lot on this show, the way, I, the way I look at this balance is I say I look at it like a fast food establishment. It's kind of the same kind of players and the same kind of hierarchy. I say, is it is it easier to do a hostile takeover of McDonald's than it is to create a burger chain that is bigger than McDonald's? Uh, say it again. Is it easier to do a hostile takeover of McDonald's, or is it easier? to create a burger chain that's bigger than McDonald's. So you don't need to create a chain that's bigger than McDonald's. Let's say McDonald's was uh, serving um, uh, subpar burgers. Which and, they do. And you, 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 <laughs> you, you do. know, so well, my, my point is you don't need to create a party that's bigger than the Democratic Party. You need to create a party that's viable. So let's say Bernie Sanders decided to start a third party with Nina Turner, Tulsi Gabbard, and some other high-profile pro pro progressives. It would immediately start polling, I'm going to guess, at a minimum 10, 15, 20 percent, right? Since most of America want a third party, I'm sure it would start polling. Let's say, let's say on the conservative side, it only polled at 10 percent. Now the Democrats know for sure they can't win on a national stage without that third party's vote. Before, they ignore the third party. They shame the third party. They try to dismiss the third party. In fact, after the primary, Hillary Clinton didn't go to the left. She went to the right, and she picked Tim Kaine as to the right of her. So they don't, they, they don't ever try to earn progressive votes. So if you had a third party that was polling at 10 15%, Everybody would know you can't win on the national level unless you get their endorsement. So now you have real power. Bernie had zero power last election. All he was, you know what he was relegated to? Doing speeches for Hillary Clinton inside gymnasiums where 100 people would show up, which proved that people are not interested in Bernie. People are interested in Bernie's policies. Because when Bernie stopped talking about a progressive agenda, people stopped wanting to listen to him, and they stopped showing up. And to Bernie's credit, he told people you shouldn't listen to me. You should listen to yourselves. So he was playing the game, and we got to stop playing their game.
Yeah. Hey, uh, one thing I want to ask you, though, is because um, you've called out Bernie Sanders to be on your show, but he has remained silent towards some of your questions, and he's remained silent towards uh, really the, the, the clear election fraud that happened during the 2016 so primary. So he's tweeting today about the Russian election fraud. Yeah. The real election fraud happened in the primary, which is why we got Trump. Right. If well, Bernie Sanders wasn't cheated, we wouldn't have Trump. Why is he silent? Why is he choosing to remain silent and really ignoring the clear evidence? I mean, the evidence is clear. The Clinton campaign and DNC establishment were working together. There's no debate. There's nothing about this. I don't care what anybody else has said. The evidence is clear that there was election fraud, and both the Clinton campaign and Democratic <laughs> establishment were working together to deny Bernie Sanders the nomination. Right. But he's remained silent. So I don't know why. I, I wish I, That's why I'd like to have him on my show to, to ask him that very question. Why haven't you uh, called out the Democratic National Committee and the Democrats? And why don't you call them out when they keep doing it? And um, so I don't know. I really don't. I'm just, I guess it's a political ca- calculation like everything else. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and, and the thing is, too, uh, we're actually witnessing here. You know, William Illinois. Binney says the survey. So William Binney, you know, he's the whistleblower at the NSA. Yeah. And he's the one they made that documentary about called The Good American. And he was the top code breaker at the NSA for years. And then he started telling the truth about corruption inside the NSA. And then they tried to get they tried to get him in jail. They tried to immediately. <laughs> so uh, he says that because of their surveillance state, that the CIA is really, you know, wagging uh, the tails, wagging the dog all over the place, and they have dirt on everybody now. And so he, you know, you could take that for what, it, you know, uh, that's true. I know that's true. How how much that affects uh, elected officials, I don't know. He seems to think it's a lot. Yeah. He, and, you know, here in Illinois, we're going to actually have a mini version of 2016. We have two billionaire candidates. This is going to be the most expensive governor's race in U.S. history uh, between Governor Bruce Rauner, who's a mm-hmm. Republican, and I still remember and your face Pritzker. when uh, – uh, I forget who was saying to you uh, how much the – you're like, oh, that's the election. They're, they're like, no, that's the primary. And you're like, what? <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that too. That was yeah. pretty. That was pretty stunning. Yeah, we yeah. Uh, yeah, remember so. we are in the besides DC. This is the most corrupt city in the country. So we're number one, Jimmy. Fantastic. So That's right. I know that we're. Ex- I wish this can go on longer. Uh, you gotta but, get John uh, Cusack in here. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. But no, is no, he no, really no. not doing your show? He doesn't do your show. No. Not often. We I mean, he used to a lot more. <laughs> John Cusack, if you want to be on our show, holler at Hard Lens Media because. But I heard he lives here in Kansas, Chicago. He doesn't live in Chicago. Oh, gee, that's news to me. I, I, I thought know. someone told me he lived here. I thought he lived in Malibu. I he lives in Malibu. They go, no, he lives in Chicago. I'm not sure. I thought that was Vince Vaughn who lived in Chicago. He lives here. No, some, somebody somebody lives here. I know I, know I live here. And we live <laughs> with Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Chris O'Donnell too. lives here, right? That's the Chris <laughs> O'Donnell guy who played Robin and Batman. Yeah. yeah I, right? Now does all those I, NCIS I, I, shows or oh, whatever. Oh, he does NCIS now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> so uh, real quick, uh, Jimmy, uh, where, where is your uh, show going to be held at uh, for it's already tomorrow? doesn't matter. It's already sold out. Oh, okay. So There you uh, go, folks. You were waiting for the announcement. It's already going. It's been sold out for a couple weeks. So uh, other than that, we do So I'm just coming on. I'm not coming on to promote <laughs> my show. I'm just coming on because I like you guys. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. I think, awesome. you guys, I think you guys do a great show. We're big fans. I was, yeah. I was listening on the way over. Nice work. Thank you. Yeah, we we really you. do appreciate your support. There's a I lot learned, of- I learned about the, the, the ICE vote, mm-hmm. right? What's happening with the uh, Trump's calling bluff and if it comes to his desk. That was, good, that was a good discussion you guys had about Thank that. you. Right, we right. try to keep it as real as possible in these times. Yes, mm-hmm. especially in this day and age of corruption. And we're covering stories that corporate media doesn't cover. So, Jimmy Dore, we're really grateful to have you here on our show. We, we invite you and everyone else on your show to come back here at any time. Please let us know when you're here in the city. And if you guys like what we do, uh, we have a Patreon page. There isn't a whole bunch of independent media here in the city of Chicago. and It's literally you know, just us. It's just point. us covering the news so. and everything else here. So other than that, uh, peace, everyone, and let's all do what we can to build a better future.